Now, we're pleased to chat with Dr. Jordan Peterson, a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, a clinical psychologist and the author of Maps of Meaning, the Architecture of Belief, and the, I think, eagerly awaited upcoming book, 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos, set for release January 23rd, 2018. The website is jordanbpeterson.com, youtube.com slash jordanpetersonvideos, twitter.com slash jordanbpeterson. You can check out the excellent self-authoring at selfauthoring.com and a personality test at understandingmyself.com. Dr. Peterson, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for the invitation. Good to see you. So as Merry we, Christmas. Merry Christmas Merry to you. As we have uh, this conversation, uh, I was having a coffee this morning, looking at the beautiful gentle snow uh, draping down around, I guess, uh, here in southern Ontario. It's a beautiful, peaceful time of year. What was Christmas like for you uh, growing up? Uh, I know that you went uh, fairly leftist in your teens. Did that have any kind of prickly relationship to Christmas for you? And how has it changed since then? Well, I think Christmas was complicated for me. I mean, there's a, it's, it's actually, there, there's a personal element to it. There's a very vicious streak of familial depression that runs in my family. And mm. so um, my father was quite prone to that. Um, although that's been rectified to some degree. And so Christmas could be a dark time for us, although it, it was also all of the positive things it was supposed to be at the same time. So our, because my father had um, seasonal affective disorder. And of course, we didn't know what the hell was going on when I was growing up. Nobody knew what that was. And it took a long time to get that sorted out. Sorted out. So it's been, it's been a very complex that t time of year has been very complex over the years. So, and then I guess the other thing is, so that's the personal end of it. The more metaphysical end is, of course, that I've spent a lot of time over the last three decades trying to understand Christianity and what the, the rituals and routines and stories mean. And so that's added another dimension to it. I mean, I understand, for example, the mythological idea that at the darkest point of the year, that's when the hero emerges. That's a very old mythological idea. Of course, you don't need a hero unless the darkness is intense, right? So it, it makes sense that that's what would call forth a hero. And of course, that's a lot of what's celebrated symbolically at Christmas. The idea of the lights on the trees is the return of illumination, right? Because the sun is starting to come back. All these things are layered on top of one another. And so it's, it's, it's a remarkable... It's one of the things that's really made me so struck as a consequence of studying Christianity is that so many levels of meaning stack on top of one another in an isomorphic manner it's and support one another you know there's a cosmic story that's associated with Christmas which is the death and rebirth of the Sun and then there's I mean the, the actual solar orb and then there's the you know more prosaic story of the birth of a baby which is of course a miraculous event in everyone's life so yeah. And it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I feel for you with the family stuff, both my mother's and my father's side have terrible history of mental illness, which is one of the reasons why for me, it's sort of like if you come from a family that has terrible heart disease, you better eat well and exercise, uh, or you're going the way of the dodo. So for me, knowing what was going on on both sides of my family, very high functioning, very smart, but uh, it's almost like the, uh, the train is too fast for the rails for a lot of these people. So I knew huh. I was going to need a lot of mental structure. I was going to need a lot of mental discipline. I better have self knowledge, I better do therapy, I better get into philosophy. Because if you can harness that power, it's great, but it seems to destroy almost as many people as it empowers. And when you have difficult family times at Christmas is really hard because the the expectation of yeah. joy and peace and the, the the movies and the commercials and and other people's houses you go to it feels like everyone else is taking off in these multicolored starships of joy and you're kind of right. left down in a dungeon and I think yes, well, this is why it's Christmas. tough for a lot of people this time okay. of year absolutely absolutely and I think you put your finger on it exactly is that well I mean what we hope is that the time around Christmas gives us a glimpse into what human relations could be like if we organize them very carefully. And I think that that can happen. But the problem is, is that you don't get peace and goodwill towards man merely by having the time of year. It's something that you really have to work at. And I mean, a lot of the problems that I've indicated that were characteristic of my family and my extended family we've actually addressed to quite with quite a bit of success over the last three decades as a consequence of well partly because I became a clinical psychologist and started to understand these things and because the biochemistry has been more well understood and and but 
it is hard on people around Christmas because, as you said, the hope and the reality, it's, it's a point of the year where hope and reality can war most, most viciously, and it can be very, very hard on people. Our suicide rates go up around Christmas for exactly that reason. So... It's a, uh, it's a magnification season. It tends to um, not exaggerate, but in a sense reveal both the strengths and joys of your relationships and the weaknesses and challenges in your relationship. And it's, to me, tragic, particularly because it's one of the few times in the year that you do have the time and the proximity to be able to work on your relationships. But there are, of course, families that studiously avoid that and avoid the dysfunction, which really tends to hollow out any festivity in the season. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. I think you're. I think you're right about it serving as a magnifier. That's. It brings out the best and the worst, and and I suppose that's useful too because you need to have the worst brought up so that brought out so that you can hypothetically de- deal with it. But it's no. It's no joke. I mean, even in the Christmas story itself, you know. I mean, so Christ is the eternal infant, the in- eternal hope, let's say, and the eternal hope of mankind, just like a, an infant is the eternal hope of mankind, but. You know, he's born in lowly circumstances and in extreme peril, right? Because all the firstborns are under um, under death sentence, essentially. And there's an archetypal element to that, too, which is really important to understand, which is that even if the hero is divine, then he's always born in in the extreme danger that characterizes existence itself. And so in some sense, that balance between tragedy and catastrophe and tyranny and hope that typifies Christi- Christmas in reality for, for day-to-day people is also built right into the story. I mean, they're in a manger for God's sake, right? It's a stable. And so it's pretty unstable, so to speak. And then, of course, there's all these radical political events going on. And, well, that's that's the way of mankind. Radical political and social events going on. That's the way of mankind. So Now, this, the transition from a desert religion to northern and Western Europe to me is really fascinating because uh, people from Europe are essentially, in, in some ways, I think even biologically defined by the seasons. And it's so fascinating to me that a desert religion, which doesn't have a huge amount to do with seasons, certainly not as much as, say, Germany or, or France or England, took root in Europe and flourished and changed in some ways to adapt to the seasonal rhythms. Uh, you know, those who were not able to defer, defer gratification and, and hoard and hold on to their food throughout the winter didn't tend to do very well. Those who didn't uh, work really hard when it was necessary uh, to, to plant and to harvest and so on, and then rest when it was near, really necessary through the winter to conserve ca- calories didn't do very well. So I really find it fascinating how a, a religion that began in the Middle East ended up adapting so perfectly to the seasonal nature of European civilization. Yeah, well, it, Christianity was like a giant vacuum cleaner in some sense. You know, it, <laughs> it 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 certainly integrated itself with and layered itself on top of existing pagan ceremonies, like well, like the tree itself, which is a, I mean, the the, the tree is a very interesting symbol because, of course, the tree is is the tree in the Garden of Eden, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. And the tree for Christmas is mostly the tree of life. And the tree is also the structure that unites heaven with earth. And the lights on the tree symbolize, um, or represent even, illumination and the reemergence of, of light in the darkness. And a lot of that was was extracted in some sense from the pagan symbolism that was that existed there prior to Christianity. I mean, the tree idea, for example, that plays a, the idea that there's a tree that unites heaven and hell, which is so, sort of something akin to Jacob's Ladder, is a central tenet of shamanism. And there are all sorts of strange shamanic echoes that permeate Christianity. And the Christmas story, like Santa Claus, is a good example. There's very interesting documentation about the relationship between the red and white of Santa Claus, for example, and the use of Amanita muscaria mushrooms among the shamanic, uh, in the shamanic tradition throughout Siberia and across the north, uh, across the entire northern strata of Europe. So yeah, it, it's a very, very deep and strange mixture of desert and and frigid cold and 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 celebration. And I guess that's also partly what's given it such longevity as a as a celebration. Even though we also seem to be doing everything we can to undermine that as fast as possible. Oh, this this is <laughs> fascinating as well to me too. Uh, the sort of power of of myth and the power of culture. 
I worked, you know, I was uh, at the National Theatre School. I wrote plays and, and novels and so on. And so I worked a lot with, with allegory, metaphor and character. And I read my Jung about sort of collective unconscious and universal archetypes. But it wasn't until I got into my 40s and really began to um, strip myself of the merely secular self and focus on deep myth and focus on the power of these kinds of uh, archetypes that I realized just how much had been taken from me, how much had been stripped from me, how much had been withheld from me about the origins of all of the symbols and um, the echoes of what yeah, I well, had the, received. Well, it's a funny thing because you actually can't live without that. You know, one of the things that's been unbelievable, unbelievable to me over the last year is well, there's a couple of things because I've been communicating with so many people in public and also online. Um, so one stream of response that's quite remarkable is that many, many people tell me that when they listen to what I've been talking about with regards to these deep symbolic structures, that it's as if they already know it, but mm -hmm. don't have the words for it. And that's exactly right. And I, I would literally say hundreds of people have said that to me. So say, well, I, it, you're reminding me of something I already know. And of course, that's actually the hallmark of archetypal thinking, because the idea of the archetype is the idea that your thinking is structured underneath it like there's a structure underneath your thinking and then your thinking can reflect that structure when you become aware of the archetypes and then that kind of puts your conscious self-knowledge in alignment with who you most deeply are it's remembering in the platonic sense and and i think that you do experience a coming home so to speak when that occurs. You know, Jung himself said that that was a better occupation for the latter half of life. And so the fact that it really started to hit home for you in your 40s actually makes sense, let's say, from a developmental perspective, because let's say you're in the last half of your life, what you're supposed to be doing with that part of your life is accruing wisdom. Mm. You know, and, and, and that for your own psychological purposes to stabilize yourself, but also so that you can act as a stabilizing force in society. So... Right. Well, and this and then, is, this sorry yeah. to interrupt, but this is the yeah. fascinating thing for me uh, over this Christmas season. I think one of the things that has occupied me particularly over the last year or two has been this question of why it seems so hard for the West to rouse itself to defend its own countries and institutions. And I think where I'm sort of getting to, I don't know if it's a final destination, but where I'm getting to is I thought that we would defend reason, evidence, abstractions, freedoms, political institutions, but we don't seem to rouse ourselves much to defend those. And I actually believe now that, and, and I think the left really understands this because the left goes for stories, they go for archetypes, they pull down statues, they do all of this, they attack myth in a sense. And I really yeah, think well, that fundamentally we, yeah, that. so fundamentally we only really defend stories. We only really defend yeah. archetypes. We only really defend myth. That's what we can rouse ourselves to do. And that's why it gets stripped from us. So we're defenseless. Well, that's actually the definition of archetypal. Archetypal is precisely what would rouse you to its defense. You know, and, and I mean, I've been trying to understand to some degree what's what the proper level of analysis is with regard to the under ongoing culture wars. And as far as I can tell, this is why I did, you know, you, you, you may know that I did a series of 15 biblical lectures this mm -hmm. year. I only got through Genesis. I'm going to start on Exodus next year. But as far as I can tell, and this is sort of in keeping with the idea of a descent into the underworld to rescue the dying father, let's say, which is also part of the Christmas story, because that's the death of the sun, the, the solar orb, and then its rebirth, is that we won't rouse ourselves to defend anything that we have unless we go back to the source of those things and understand what it is that we actually possess. Now, I've been trying to make a case over the last year for the divinity of the individual, essentially, which is the central idea of the Christian story, right? I mean, the divine child is only potential, even. It's, and, but but given, the, given the symbolic importance of a world redeeming figure, that's what the new infant is. And, and the thing about that, you can strip that of its dogmatic connotations, although there's reasons not to, but you can and read it purely psychologically. And it's a story about the fact that what truly is the light in the darkness is the potential in each individual human being. And that's the story of the West. And the thing about that story is that it's right. It's correct. We got it right. Because otherwise it's, it's chaos or the group. It's hmm. like, 
Well, you don't want chaos unless you want chaos. And believe me, man, if you want chaos, you better bloody well get prepared for it. Because maybe you're not the kind of bloodthirsty monster that could really revel in it. Mm. And maybe you are, too. And then if all you want is the group, well, you better bloody well be prepared for that, too, because the group is not you. And if if it comes to if push comes to shove, the group will sacrifice you for its own interest in no time flat. And so if you think that salvation lies on those two pole ends of the distribution, you've got another think coming. Well, that's so, the mere Darwinian lust for power. And this, to me, is one of the great stories that's important to remember about the first syllable of Christmas, which is Christ, which is that, to me, the elemental story, and it's not that there's one, but the one that's resonating for me most at the moment, Jordan, is this idea that if you reject material power, you achieve immortality. Because that, to me, is the great temptation of the world. And, and this, to me, is coming out of the Hollywood stuff where there is this basic satanic deal that's offered to a lot of these young actors and actresses, which is, uh, you know, if you surrender to my earthly lusts, if you surrender to the humiliating subjugation to pretend to find me attractive, though I'm old and grizzled and look like half a shaved bugbear, if you, if you surrender, then um, I will grant you material wealth, fame and power, beyond your wildest desires. That to me is Jesus out in the desert. And right, this is right. a very strong thing that has happened. But Jesus, of course, by rejecting that, achieved an influence far beyond anything he could well, have, even if he'd taken the entire well, world the devil offered. It's really, it's really interesting too, because it isn't, it isn't even, I don't think so much a matter of rejecting it. It's, 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 it's formulating a better deal. Hmm. You know, so the story of Christ in the desert is, and I, I've spent a lot of time, in fact, I, I, I write about that a lot in my new book, in, in chapter 7, which is called, Do What is Meaningful, Not What is Expedient. Mm -hmm. And I think of meaning as, first of all, I think that meaning is the most real of all phenomena, with the possible exception of pain. But I think it might even be more real than pain, because it can supplant and transcend pain. So, and meaning... The, the, uh, the notion of meaning is not something that modern scientists have dealt well with in the main, although many of the, especially the physiologists like Jeffrey Gray have done a very good job of laying the groundwork, and, and Jak Panksepp, who's a great neuroscientist, have laid, started to lay the groundwork for a neuroscience-oriented uh, understanding of the phenomena of meaning. But what, what happens in the desert is that what, Christ's tell, what Christ tells the devil is that the bargain that the devil is offering is nowhere as nowhere near as good as it seems because he's after something greater you know he says well man does not live with by bread alone and the idea is that it isn't so much that that you should reject the the attractions of wealth and status and privilege and power it's that there's something that you could pursue that's way better than that in every possible way and that has to do with well, first of all, developing the sort of character that's capable of withstanding evil, and second, setting your sights on reducing the suffering in the world. It's something like that. It's laid out quite nicely in the Sermon on the Mount, I would say, which is a very difficult document to parse through. But it's it's not all it's not all rejection. It's like why would you why would you go for leaden weight when gold is right in front of you? And that's and I think like one of the things I've really come to understand about these symbolic representations is that they are they're metaphorical and you might call them abstract and ideal even and so then they tend to be otherworldly they tend to be viewed as if they're otherworldly virtues it's nothing could be farther from the truth the the practical advantage of genuine virtue is so striking that nothing else even exists in the same category and and that's part of the warning in the desert it's like well here's let me give you an example it, it, and I don't know if this is quite appropriate, but I'm going to use it anyway. So, um, I've been following what's been happening at Wilfrid Laurier, which I find surreally remarkable. I can't, I can't see how the university could be handling the scandal worse if they scripted it to be. Can you just say, uh, yeah, just give a quick overview for the people yeah, uh, who, who who aren't aware? Well, what happened at Wilfrid Laurier was that a TA, uh, Lindsay Shepard was brought in front of what can only be termed a uh, a minor inquisition for having the temerity to show five minutes of a Canadian public television uh, show about Bill C-16 and pronoun usage. And um, she was 
accused of breaking provincial and federal law, violating university policy, and of being a transphobic bigot. And, and that broke because she recorded the story and leaked it. And I mean, there's been international outrage over this event, and yet the university hasn't, I don't think it's learned a damn thing. In fact, from what I've been able to tell, every move it's made in reaction to this scandal has actually made the scandal worse. And that's very interesting. But, well, one of the side stories is that on that very same TV show, The Agenda with Steve Paik and the president of Wilfrid Laurie University, Deborah McClatchy, was invited to talk about the university's response to this scandal. And I watched that and I thought it was so interesting to me because Deborah McClatchy has attained worldly dominion, let's say. She's the yeah. president of a major university. It's not a trivial position. And then the interviewer, Steve Pakin, who's actually liberal left, I would say, in his fundamental orientation and inclined to be a decent interlocutor, period, and maybe even a friendly one to someone like Deborah McClatchy, he asked her a dozen questions about whether she felt that Lindsay Shepard had actually made a mistake and what the university was going to do about it. And what was so amazing to me was that despite her position of power and privilege, let's say, so-called, she didn't utter a single word that was her own during the entire interview. It was like there was no person there at all. And what that indicated to me was that in order to attain that position, which was hypothetically, you know, an elevated position in the dominance hierarchy, um, <clears throat> she had to give up everything that was actually powerful, hmm. including her own voice. So, and that's, that's, that's a great object lesson. It's like, you know, you, you want power, let's say, and, and you want, and you're willing to make a bargain with the devil to get it. And what you think is that when you get that power, you'll still be the same person that you were when you started seeking it. And the problem with that is you're not going to be the same person even a little bit. There'll be nothing left of you. And you'll be a puppet of the position rather than being the master of the position. Well, you think it's feeding you, but it's eating you. And uh, this is this is one of the great and terrible consequences to me. Uh, this is why censorship tends to escalate. Because if you let a little bit of censorship in, then people's muscles for dealing with oppositional ideas become weaker, which means that they become more hostile to the oppositional ideas that reveal their weakness and must keep everything at bay. And I don't know where this, well, we all know where this ends up in the long run, which then ends up in concentration camps and mass slaughter, which is then all ideas uh, become markers of ultimate evil, of anti-persons, of that whom you can dehumanize and end up slaughtering, as we've seen, of course, in communism and fascism around the world throughout history. And that is a strong statement to make, but uh, it seems to me that we have come to such a hysterical level uh, in terms of censorship, that people don't seem to have any welcome for robust uh, debate, for well, opposing ideas. And that means, of course, well, that we have vanity because everybody thinks they have the final answer and therefore they can just squelch all contrary opinions. That is a demonic kind of a vanity. It's interesting, though. Like, I am would say I'm more optimistic at the end of this year than I was at the end of last year. And the reason for that is that what I've seen happening, like I think the state of free expression on university campuses is, to call it appalling, is to barely scratch the surface. And I think that the forces that are corrupting the university are in fact spreading out, uh, spreading out into broader society. I think in corporations they're doing that through human resources. Mm. And I think the university is directly to blame for this because it's produced, um, uh, let's say, investigative tools like the implicit association test, which has been misused beyond comprehension. You know, one of the things that's interesting about that implicit association test is that one of the people who designed it, Brian Nozek, has really started to turn against it. So there's a fractionation occurring within the little coterie of people who produce that appalling. I mean, the test itself is quite interesting as a, as a measurement a device, but when it becomes a political weapon, it's the thing behind all of this unconscious bias, right? And and the unco and by the way, there was a new review article published by Nozek himself, who was one of the founders of the IAT, that indicated quite clearly that attempts to redress unconscious bias by staff training have ha have zero effect, zero mm -hmm. effect, right? So, so but but okay, so there's lots of corruption in the in the academy. And that's distributing itself out into broader society. But one of the things that's happening is that um, 
platforms like YouTube, particularly YouTube, but also the other social media platforms are flipping that upside down. So as the universities become more corrupt and more rigid, and as the old media sources become more ideologically driven and less um, competent, people are abandoning them in, mm. at in extraordinarily, extraordinary rates. And then you see what's happening instead is that on YouTube, you know, you, you get people like Joe Rogan, well, and yourself, but Rogan's a, a really good example of three hour lengthy detailed podcasts that are so popular that it's beyond comprehension. So much for the, you don't need the reporter, you don't need the soundbite. It's like we're getting rid of the priesthood in some <laughs> sense, again. Yeah. You can, do, you, you, can, you can talk directly to the public with no intermediation. And I think we're just starting to see how powerful a force that's going to be. Oh, I think it was about 10 years ago I did a show um, which was that the internet is the new Gutenberg. It is that which right. allows you to bring the text directly to the audience. It doesn't mean you don't need a priesthood because there's still you need experts, but it is, you're right. I mean, as far as the opportunities for breaking down oligarchical hierarchies, we've never had this kind of opportunity. And I think, I really too, truly believe that, that universities as they're currently instituted are done. They, they simply too. will not survive this transition. Philosophy in particular, where, where did it start? I mean, if you don't really count the pre-Socratics, it started with Socrates. And what did Socrates do? He wandered around the marketplace and talked with people about philosophy and said, if you buy me lunch, that would be great. And what is the donation yeah. model? Other than a return to the origins of philosophy, people bringing their wisdom to the marketplace of ideas and saying, hey, buy me lunch if you like it. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, and it, you, you can really have your cake and eat it too on YouTube because, I mean, you know, I decided last year in April, thereabouts, before any of this scandal broke around me, that I was going to experiment with Patreon, which I thought was an in, because I've been interested in the monetization of creative production for a long time from, from a research perspective. And, you know, my sense has always been to investigate things personally to, to find out how they work so that that can feed what I'm doing from a research perspective, say. So I set up this Patreon account and I also decided not to monetize my YouTube videos because I, I didn't think that the advertising was appropriate given the content. It was something like that. And so I thought, well, I'll try Patreon instead because then I can see if it works and if I generate any income, I can increase the quality of my offerings. And, um, and that's been that's been unbelievably useful because I'm in this we're very weird situation where I give away everything I produce. I mean, <laughs> I've got some commercial programs, which are a different issue, but I give away everything I produce intellectually and it's produced far more consequences, including financial consequences that mm -hmm. couldn't and could have possibly been imagined. And so, well, we're, when we're, and I do like, look at, look at how quickly the, the new media, let's say, especially YouTube has eviscerated the old media. I mean, that's just going to accelerate over the next two or three years. So I see like classic, classic news in institutions or, or media institutions like CBC, they're so dead in the water, they can't even imagine it. Well, here's a funny thing. And I, I'd like you to talk about this, if you don't mind, Jordan, because it's an amazing perspective that you get when you're a public intellectual. Because the mainstream institutions... I want to speak for you. The mainstream institutions that I've experienced are fairly hostile and negative towards this kind of stuff that we're doing. And the people, though, the people that you're actually talking to are, you know, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, engaged, robust, positive about the interaction. I think you have to kind of be at this fulcrum. You have to be at this apex to see the difference between elite institutions and the people as a whole. Because if you're kind of in between these two worlds and you're being attacked yeah. by the mainstream media and you're, in a sense, being beloved by the people you're talking to, I don't think that there's a view that shows the culture wars and the culture gap between the elites and the people more so than doing what we're doing. I, I agree. Uh, it, and it, it's, you know, it, it's funny, too, because I've been treated extremely, I would say, by the mainstream press. And by that, I mean, I've had stories about me that are so dreadful that they're hard to even take seriously because they're, <laughs> it's as if they're written, well, it's as if they're written by someone from who, who, who I don't understand by someone. It's sort of like, a, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to meet this evil twin of mine yeah. about whom you well, are writing. Well, and they're so badly researched that even the accusations aren't, it's hard to be offended by an accusation that doesn't even seem like it's about you. 
So, but by the same token, I've had many, many people, credible people in the mainstream press mount extraordinarily strong defenses of what I've doing, what I've been doing, but also of the principles that I've been trying to put forward, you know, like, and, and I would say that includes the most powerful columnists and media people in Canada. It's not all of them, obviously, but it's been people like Margaret Wenta and Conrad Black and um, Rex Murphy, who's, who's just a dead, who's deadly with the pen and with his voice. <laughs> And Antonello Artuso, and like a very a large, and I, that's not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. But I mean, I also get the impression from from those people, some of whom I've got to know quite well, that they're like they're cast adrift from a sinking ship ship in a very unstable life raft, and that those are people who wielded tremendous journalistic power. They they feel that there's no stability whatsoever in their future because they can see the old media forms rocking and being pulled apart like mad. And, you know, the fact that this is happening so quickly to the classic, to classic media, to me, indicates exactly what's going to happen to the universities. They're so, their model is so flawed. So I've been thinking about, I've watched major institutions fall apart, corporations, and I, and I see how it happens. And it, it accelerates once it starts to happen rather than decelerating. But imagine, it's way too expensive to educate a university student. It's probably 10 times too expensive, about $50,000 a year in Canada and more in the US. It's administratively top heavy beyond belief. They're producing all these kangaroo courts and, and emphasis on diversity, inclusivity and, and equity at the expense of actual intellectual endeavor. The ethics committees are impeding uh, high quality scientific research. Students are being laden with debt loads that are absolutely unsustainable. The faculty is being stripped of their power and replaced by adjuncts. The, the um, accreditation process is becoming completely untrustworthy because of, a, of de emphasis on qualitative distinctions. It's like there's, there's and, and, the, and the universities itself, especially in the humanities, which is the heart of the universities, have become ideologically possessed to such a degree that they no longer even offer what it was that you were supposed to be paying for to begin with. So as far as I can tell, they're done. That's yeah. what it looks like to me. So, you know, it's going to, a huge thing takes a long time to fall over. But you can see, you know, here's an example. You know, if you're in an oil tanker and... You see, a, you see an iceberg in your path, let's say. It's too late to turn because the thing has so much momentum given its size that you can't make a course correction in time to stop from hitting it. You know, you have to detect it miles or tens of miles out. And that's the same thing as far as I can tell that's happening to the universities. Like Oberlin College last, which is one of the places last year that we really flipped out from a social justice perspective, it's just getting slaughtered in the marketplace right now because students are not going. And that's what's going to happen. As soon as there are viable alternatives, men are already doing this. They're leaving the university in droves. Well, I mean, I think everything, <clears throat> almost everything rots behind the high walls of state power and this protection from the marketplace. The rawest and most productive intellectual exercises, I think, are happening on the edge of the marketplace of ideas. And that's YouTube. That's where people do podcasting and so on, where there is not that filter. There is not that self-censorship. There is not that necessarily concern with long-term career, but there is a dedication to the truth and the audience. And I think what's going to happen is, right now... Having a university degree is still considered on the balance of positive by employers, but I think that once they realize what's being taught, how much hostility towards whites, towards males, towards the free market, towards you name it, I think at some point there's going to be a tipping point and uh, the, the employers are going to say, oh, you have an arts degree from XYZ institution. Well, that Google. means that you're going to be dangerous and a liability. Oh, yeah. It's, it's oh, yeah. an inverse I, IQ test almost oh, now. And the other already, thing is, if you're smart happened. enough to not go to university, that's going to be a kind of proxy IQ test for them yeah, as well. Well, the, the corporations are learning. I mean, they knew that, that they've known for a long time that, say, if you have an arts degree, you still have to be trained specifically to do whatever job you're being hired for. But they could assume a certain level of of literary competence and capacity to learn, let's say. So there was value there. But the co corporations are, are certainly starting to, to understand that they could hire people younger, even before university, and train them themselves and, and just circumvent all that ideological idiocy and also offer people a lower starting salary because they're not burdened with 
with debt. And so, yeah, that's that's happening. And I, I would hope, although I'm not certain of this, that CEOs in particular would start to wake up and realize that human resources has become an anti-capitalist fifth column in the middle of their organizations. And that and that the human resources people in general are trained as social justice warriors and are are pursuing an agenda that's absolutely antithetical to the to 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 the principles upon which the corporation itself is 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 founded. Well, well then they act, sorry to interrupt, but they also act as a powerful filter to keep non-leftists out of the organization, which is why you see big corporations lurching from social justice warrior crisis to social justice warrior crisis, because yeah. they don't have opposing voices in the institution pushing back because human resources has acted as a giant filter to keep non-leftists out of the organization. Well, and they do things like, like uh, it was Apple, I think, most recently that had hired a vice president of equity, diversity, and inclusivity or something, they actually had to get rid of her because she turned out to be pretty damn sensible. You know, and she said she said some things like, well, maybe we should consider diversity of opinion. And like the mob just ripped her apart and she had to resign or, or was fired. I don't remember which it was. But I, I don't think I don't think that big companies understand how much trouble they're allowing themselves to get into by letting these this ideological movement loose in the organization. But on the upside, Stefan, I would say one of the things that's wonderful about, about capitalism is that corporations that make mistakes die. <laughs> it's, so, it's hard as, you know, as a, as a nimble mammal of the internet, it's hard for me to look at the incoming meteor and the dinosaurs and their uniting with great um, sorrow because it's just going to open up a lot of opportunity. So there's two right. other things I'd like to touch on regarding uh, Christmas. The first, okay. yeah, the, so the first is um, the question which I have wrestled with for many years and I have yet to resolve, the question of sacrifice. So I come out of the sort of objectivist uh, Ayn Rand tradition where sacrifice is considered a seven deadly sin. I've really revised that over time because there are certainly times as a public thinker that uh, it does feel a little bit like there's some sacrifices involved to put it mildly but it's worth it and this question of sacrifice uh, christmas is a lot about self-indulgence in terms of materialism which i have no particular problem mm -hmm. with in terms mm -hmm. of good eating which i also enjoy to do but i think this question of sacrifice has really been lost from uh, christmas and from a lot of people's thinking as a whole this kind of what's well, in it for we, me how can i accrue material gains is very central so where do you where does sacrifice sit in your mind at the moment well in these biblical lectures i did i talked about sacrifice a lot because we we walked through genesis and of course especially from cain and abel forward which is basically right from the beginning of the document there's a tremendous emphasis on the rituals that are associated with sacrifice and sacrifice is an unbelievably powerful idea it's it's perhaps the most brilliant idea of mankind because the sacrificial idea is you can give up something of value now strategically and carefully ethically and be rewarded for it manifold in the future and that's basically the discovery of the future it's the same thing, because when you discover the future, it means that you have to start to think strategically about your actions in the present in relationship to the future. And that's a sacrificial attitude, because what happens is you realize that things that could bring you impulsive pleasure right now, getting well, the getting's good, is not a good medium to long-term strategy and might not be a good individual or collective strategy. So, so here's one way of thinking, but, and this is where I think Ayn Rand was wrong. Like, there's very little difference between, so there's the you I'm talking to, right? But there's the you that hypothetically extends, let's say, 30 years out into the future. Mm -hmm. And so you could think there's the day-to-day -day you 30 years into the future and the week-to-week -week and the month-to-month -month and the year-to-year -year you. And in some sense, that you that extends into the future isn't much different than other people. You know? So if you're acting in the moment to ensure that your long-term uh, thriving is is potentiated, you're going to act in a manner towards yourself that's not much different than the way that you would react to others that you were treating properly. And so I would say, like Rand's problem is, is that I think that she draws too tight a line between competition, say competition, selfishness, and public good. Those don't, those do not have to be antithetical. In fact, I don't think they are. I think that when you act most wisely in your own best self-interest, you simultaneously act in the best interest of 
the people around you and broader society. And that's, that's part of this stacking up of, of levels of analysis. You can have your cake and eat it too. And so the reason that you should regulate your impulses, let's say, and discipline yourself isn't so that you can suffer the kind of privation and self-sacrifice in relationship to being an altruist that Ayn Rand complained about with good reason. It's because you want to regulate and discipline yourself because that way you can serve a master, let's say, that serves everything at once. And I, 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 I've ceased believing that that's, a, that that's merely a metaphysical statement. You know, like if I conduct myself so that my family maximally benefits along with me, how could that be anything but good also for me? So, right. so sacrifice properly understood isn't, it's again, it's back to our earlier discussion. It's not the rejection of worldly goods. It's not self-abnegation and, and, and flagellation. It's the replacement of a relatively unsuccessful strategy, power, domination, like worldly pleasure, let's say, with a ethic that's inconceivably better on all dimensions. Right. So here's the big challenge as well. I guess this is maybe just asking for advice around the question of forgiveness. So forgiveness to me has become very muddied of late. Mm. And the reason for that is that I understand that if someone wrongs me and they show contrition, they apologize, they make amends, and I refuse to forgive them, that's giving me unfair and unjust power over them. And that's a wrong thing for me to do. On the other hand, if someone has wronged me, refuses to admit wrong, escalates and, and so on, then forgiveness is not earned. And I think it's unjust to, to provide forgiveness to someone yeah. like that. And so the idea that forgiveness is something to be earned, that forgiveness should be willed regardless of whether it's earned or not, that's something I'm still spinning okay. kind of my wheels around. Yeah, yeah. Well, that okay, there's a couple of things there. I mean, I would say in the Christian tradition, forgiveness and repentance have always been tightly allied. You can't separate them. And so, and I would also say that the best source for, that I've found for walking through that particular dilemma is Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. Mm. Because especially in the second volume, he addresses very specifically, okay, so here's the scenario. So you're in a Gulag concentration camp and that's not very pleasant. And the newest inmate is a high ranking communist official who's just been devoured by the system that he produced. And he's, and he's now done in, in every possible way. What do you do with him? Because he's simultaneously victim and perpetrator. And Solzhenitsyn walks through that very carefully. And his, his fundamental realization, I think, is something along the lines of don't cast pearls before swine. So Solzhenitsyn's meditation led him to the conclusion that as long as the victim is still the perpetrator, so still putting forward, say, these communist propositions and identifying with the state and feeling that they're an unjust but innocent victim and everyone else in the prison is guilty, then there's no communication with them. They're mm. still in the valley of the damned. But as soon as they break and realize the catastrophe that's occurred to them and start to question the validity of the system, then you offer a hand and help pull them out of the mire, right? Because that's when they repent. And like, let's say you want to forgive someone. Maybe there's two reasons for that. One is because you could help redeem them. But the other is so that you don't have to carry the weight of the hatred and resentment, mm. right? And so there's a certain amount of psychological utility in having a forgiving attitude just so you don't carry around any more slings and arrows than you have to. So that's pure self-interest. With regards to forgiving someone, though, in a more in a deeper sense, it's like repentance is vital to that process. I'll forgive you, assuming if you wrong me, I'll forgive you if you come and say, well, look, here's here's why I wronged you. Here's the specific things that I was thinking that were wrong and the specific things that I was doing that were wrong, motivating me, that led me to transgressing against you. I've laid them out as my sins, let's say. I figured out a way that I won't do it anymore. I figured mm. out why I shouldn't do it anymore. And so can we wipe the slate clean? And your answer in that situation should be, 
Well, absolutely. Yeah. It's like, yes, because- Well, and, and sorry to interrupt, but the yeah. wrong, in my experience, Jordan, the wrongs that people do to you or the wrongs that you do to people can be part of making the relationship stronger and better because when you've done wrong and repaired it and learned from oh, yeah. it, you don't repeat it. And the, the, the ties that bind you, like we always think, oh, I've done something wrong to someone, that's a bad thing. Sure, it's bad, but if successfully resolved, it can make the relationship far stronger oh. and far deeper. Look, that happens with children and, and husbands and wives all the time. And like, you know, even Franz de Waal, who's done a lot of studies of chimpanzee behavior, has, has, has noted the same thing among chimps. <clears throat> the issue isn't whether or not they fight, because they fight. The issue is whether or not they make up. And that is it. It's like, there's going to be conflict in a relationship and who's doing wrong to who is not ob not often obvious to begin <laughs> That's with. True. A lot a lot of arguments are about that. Well, no, I think you did it wrong. No, I think it's you. No, I think it's you. I mean, if you're smart and it's someone you're tethered to like a child or a, or a spouse, then you're both wrong and you should both be figuring out what you did wrong so you don't have to do it again if you had any sense because then it won't be replicated. But it's definitely the case that having that conflict laying out the repentance and re and and forgiveness process and then re re retying those bonds makes the relationship way stronger because that's way what trust stronger. is you don't need trust if someone's behaving perfectly like any yes. more than you need to see the doctor if you never ever experience any ill health so trust to me is when people have problems and successfully resolve them that is the very basis of trust and one of the things that drives me nuts about the younger generation's relationships is they seem so volatile to the point where even if there's some ideological disagreement there's this massive tearing and everybody just flees in opposite directions they don't build the trust of repairing that which they've torn yeah, well, that's reconciliation, you know, and that's a, that's a very tough thing. Well, I also think because the transaction costs of relationship transformation have fallen tremendously over the last 30 years. I mean, you know, we're bombarded by so many technological and even biological revolutions that we can't even keep track of them. You know, I would say for any society that hasn't hadn't gone completely manic in its rate of transformation, the mere introduction of something like Tinder is a mm. major biological revolution. I mean, think about Tinder. Okay, so Tinder has removed rejection from male sexual behavior for the first time in human history because you get rejected invisibly. Right. Right? So you put out your profile and thousands of women, in principle, look at you and all of them reject you except two. But you don't know. And the fact that two didn't is fine because all you care about is that two didn't. Right. And so, and so, the reason I'm bringing that up in relationship to what you said is that because it's become less costly to just switch a relationship, even that's all surface. It's not less costly. It's right. far more costly. But on the surface, it's become less costly. Then there's no logical reason why people should have to stay together and fight it through. You know, because mm. if I think, oh Jesus, you're such a pain, I should replace you. It's like, yeah, well, first of all, can I? Because why would anyone want to be with something as wretched as me? And second, the transaction cost is going to be punishingly high. Like maybe it'll take three years and there's no guarantee and I'm going to get older. And so maybe like bad as you are, I might as well just stick it out with you. But if I think, well, I can replace you in 15 seconds, well, then I don't have to fight with you. And then you can also fall prey to the delusion that that next person that you find is somehow going to be less problematic than the person that you've already traded in. And the problem with that is, is that it's, it's not the person that you traded in that's the problem, probably. It's probably you, and you're gonna bring yourself to the next relationship. So, yeah, it's a, it is really useful to, to teach children and to also understand that reconciliation is the answer to conflict, not the reduction of conflict, right? You have to, you have, to have conflict because otherwise you're not living. Yeah, like I remember when, when, even when I was younger, like when I was a kid, when 
people's parents would would break up and this was i guess in the 70s uh, this was happening a lot and um i remember saying well i'm sorry that they failed and people were like well, what do you mean they're just discovering themselves they're out there self-actualizing yeah, yeah, right. one of them's going to become a painter the other one's going to oh, go pick sure. grapes in queensland oh, yeah, and i was yeah. like no no it's a failure you made a commitment to stay together for your life you broke that commitment at the expense of your children that is a massive failure right. now it may be for the best in some you know he was horribly abusive and so on then you got to figure out why you were with an abusive person but can we call it for what it is a failure this is, seems to have gone yes, out of the window i think you're well i think like i don't think there's any evidence that that liberalizing the divorce laws was a useful move yeah. i think that i think it was a catastrophic move i think the people who paid the price for that are children and yeah. and you know we say well we're only staying together for the sake of the children it's like hey that's not so bad that's not so bad. It's like <laughs> I think the children prefer children, that. <laughs> after all, and you have a primary moral obligation. Once you have those children, who cares about you? You're an epiphenomena. <laughs> right. Your 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 well being is to be put clearly secondary, not to be eradicated completely because you don't want to be a martyr to your children. That's just and your children don't want that from you, that's for sure. But the idea that yeah, it's 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 shallow. It's the idea that relationships are infinitely divisible and fractionable, and you can you can pop out of your primary commitment and go find yourself, especially once you've had children. I find that morally reprehensible, and I think it's it's done incalculable damage to our society. It's like, yeah. and I also and I learned this from Jung a fair bit. It's like one of the things he keeps pointing out is that there are some games that you do not get to play unless you're all in hmm. and marriage is one of those games that the idea behind marriage is i'm not going to leave period right. I, and and but what should be understood along with that is the unspoken subtext which is you're fucking horrible you're malevolent life is tragic the complexity is going to overwhelm us this is going to be terrible but i'm not going to leave <laughs> so, so you know, what would you I'll like? Think, well, I'm not going to leave as long as I'm happy. Well, <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. I mean, you you don't need virtue. I mean, you don't need nutrition if you only eat what you want and what you like. I mean, you need these disciplines because we have to act against our instincts from time to time. And of course, as you know, the studies are very clear that couples who are considering divorce who stay together five years later, they're like, well, thank God we never got divorced. Uh, that was great. Well, uh, and the but the studies, the studies with regards to to the proper construction of a family, let's say, are also clear. It's way better for kids to have an intact family with two parents, period. Yeah. There's yeah. just no debate about that. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some single parents struggling valiantly who do a better job than some intact families. But on, 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 look at from any reasonable objective perspective, the data is crystal, cl crystal clear and painfully self-evident. So, Do you realize how much of the internet would be saved, how much bandwidth and typing would be saved if we just taught, taught, taught statistics starting in grade school so that you wouldn't have to put these qualifiers in all the time? It's a bell curve. I know there are exceptions, yeah, but yeah. yeah. yeah so well, let's, um, let's close with um, what you would like to say to the, I guess, the millions of people who are gonna end up listening to and, and watching this. Uh, what's your Christmas message, uh, particularly, I guess, looking forward into, I think, what's gonna be an extremely exciting year in 2018? Well, let's, let's think about it sociopolitically. Let's, let's manifest some hope and say, well, it is a dark time and we're badly polarized and this is the perfect time for the rebirth of the hero. And that's what, that's what Christmas is about. And it's about that at every level. So you can allow that to be reborn in your own heart. That, that you know, and the birth of Christ is the birth of the logos, right? The word that sets, that, that extracts order out of chaos. It's the thing that always, always eternally sets things right. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. And you want to welcome that into your heart and into your family. Because if you don't, you're lost. This, this stuff is so... These, these ideas are so necessary and so vital that you cannot live without them. And so it's useful to, to understand profoundly what Christmas means. It means that the Logos is eternally reborn at the darkest period of time. And if you're not on your knees in gratitude for that, then you know very little about the horrors of the world. 
Right. Well, thank you very much. I also want to thank you, of course, uh, at a personal level for the work that you're doing out there in the world for some of the great conversations we've had. Uh, I look forward for many more to come. And uh, thanks so much for your time this season. Good talking to you. Thanks for the invitation and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.